Hello, I'm Dr. Randall Seacrest, your host for eOrthopod TV. Today I have as my guest Dr. Carter Beck. Dr. Beck is a neurosurgeon. Dr. Beck did his medical school training at the University of Chicago School of Medicine. From there, he finished a neurosurgical residency at Stanford University. Good morning, Dr. Beck. Good morning, Randall. Thanks for joining us today. What I'd like to discuss today is your approach to a, a very common problem uh, in patients with low back pain, which is not necessarily a spine condition, but a condition of a joint right next to the spine called the sacroiliac joint. Yeah, it's an important problem. Um, let's talk a little bit about how that, that joint causes problems. Um, how do you know if you have a sacroiliac, excuse me, sacroiliac joint dysfunction or sacroiliac joint pain? Well, that's one of the problems, I think, for the physicians involved is it can be fairly difficult to tell um, at times whether the, the pain somebody's describing is coming from the sacroiliac joint. Um, the sacroiliac joint is a joint that is between the sacrum, which is the tailbone, and the ilium, which is the, the wing, the, the fan-shaped uh, bone which goes out to, to uh, form the hip joint. Um, so it's really, it's the transition between the, the spine and the hip. And uh, it's, uh, it's been notorious over the years for causing people trouble. One of the, uh, typically people have pain down around their tailbone. Uh, it's sort of a V-shaped uh, area. It can be tender to the touch. It bothers them when they sit, it bothers them when they stand, it bothers them when they lie in bed. And uh, there is a pattern which uh, those of us who see a fair amount of it uh, begin to recognize. Um, but it, it's often difficult to make the diagnosis. One of the, one of the first ways to find out whether the sacroiliac joint is the culprit and is what's bothering a patient is to have a steroid injection. And uh, we have physicians who will uh, put a, a needle into the joint, inject some steroids and some Novocaine. And uh, if that causes a patient immediate or, or significant pain relief, which lasts them for a week or two, uh, you have a pretty good idea at that point that that, that that may be the cause of what's bothering the patient. Now, a couple of questions. You know, it, it's I, in my research, I, I've sort of. Um, uh, talk to folks who, who deal with patients without spine surgery, who've never had spine surgery, and even in that population, the, 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 the statistics are that probably one in five, 20% of people who come into your office complaining of low back pain, as you go through a history and physical and ultimately make a diagnosis, that 20% that of those people will actually have pain that's coming from the SI joint and not coming from the spinal, spinal column itself. Now, I think that, that that figure even goes up when you're dealing with patients who've had spine fusions, for example. And I'm, I'm interested in your, your take on patients who've had maybe one or two fusions with several segments in the spine. Why are these people prone to developing pain after that in that sacroiliac joint? What's causing that? Well, it's an interesting problem, and that's one of the things that has gotten me particularly interested in the disease is right now the sacroiliac joint is one of the things which is limiting my success. And people who have very diseased spines, I'm able to reconstruct a very, very diseased uh, spine in an elderly patient um, and take on things that we, we wouldn't dream of 10 years ago. Uh, Sometimes the results, the, the degree of pain relief, the, uh, the, how happy a patient is when, when I'm finished with that is being limited by what we think is the sacroiliac joint. And I, the, there's a principle in spine surgery that when you fix one joint, you, there frequently is uh, uh, a complication or, a, or, or disease which develops in an adjacent segment. The spine has many joints in it, and uh, adjacent segment disease is something we struggle with. Um, unlike an appendix where you only have one, and when, the di when you have appendicitis and you take out the appendix, patient's never going to have a problem with their appendix again. In the spine, there are dozens of joints, and uh, one of the things that we see is that the next joint in line is often the one that goes next. So a uh, patient comes in with a problem at, say, L4-5, a year or two later, they may have a problem with L3-4. The extension of that principle is to say, what, what happens if you've done a reconstruction or a fusion on, on three levels at the base of the spine, and now the, the, the sacrum is fused to the lumbar spine, uh, 
What's the next joint, the adjacent segment to that going inferiorly? Well, that's the sacroiliac joint. So um, I think that one of the problems here is that uh, with the sacroiliac joint is it's essentially is adjacent segment disease. It's the next mobile structure which can be prone to arthritis to which the forces from the lumbar spine can be transmitted. So what's happening is you, you fix the problem in the spine. That pain goes away. Now all the stress is transferred to the SI joint, and now the patient's complaining of pain in a different area. Exactly. That's really aggravated the SI joint. Exactly. Now, you had mentioned that, that the diagnosis of this is, is really comes down to injecting the joint and see if you can make the pain go away. Do you ever do any type of imaging studies or x-rays or anything? Will they help you at all make this diagnosis? Yeah, I think, uh, I think all of the above can help, um, but not with a very high frequency. Uh, something can be learned about the sacroiliac joint on a plain x-ray. We can learn something sometimes on an MRI scan. We can learn something from a, a CAT scan or even a, a bone scan, which is a, a nuclear medicine study where, where a radioactive uh, tracer accumulates in joints that are, uh, joints that are arthritic. And there's a classic uh, finding on a bone scan for uh, what we call sacroiliitis, which mm -hmm. means um, d disease in the sacroiliac joint, arthritic disease. And there's, uh, there's lots of things that can cause pain in the SI joint. I think the, the number one one cause that I see is just what we would consider idiopathic, which means we don't know what's causing the problem. It's not really an arthritis that you can say these people haven't had had spine surgery, so you can't really uh, blame uh, spine fusion for it, but they just walk in off the street and for some reason they have pain or a dysfunction in the SI joint, and I don't think we ever know the cause. Right. What, what most of us think is that there's some laxity in the joint, um, and it seems to be a more frequent problem than women. Women's pelvises are shaped differently than men, and, um, and during childbirth, uh, the, the ligaments all around a woman's pelvis are relaxed to, to permit the uh, birth of the child. Uh, it may be that in, on some of those patients, uh, that, that ligamentous laxity never uh, really restores itself, and over time, 20, 30, years, that laxity uh, becomes painful. Mm -hmm. I think we should point out that there's some systemic arthritis, like rheumatoid arthritis, spondyl, uh, ankylosing spondyl arthropathy, and even um, psoriatic arthritis that can affect that joint, because that's a synovial joint like any other joint in the body. So anything that affects the rest of the synovial joints can actually affect the SI joints, and, and ankylosing spondylitis is one of the classics that actually affects the SI joints to the point where they, in late in the disease, even fuse together, um, like the spine does in ankylosing spondylitis. Absolutely. Um, well, let's move on a little bit to, the, to, the, to, to discuss the treatment options for patients who have been identified as having SI joint pain. I mean, what, what do we do with those patients this, these days? Well, like all uh, of these uh, arthritic disorders, there's a gradation of treatment, um, and there's a um, and there's variation in the severity of the pathology. There's some people who have a very mild sacroiliac dysfunction or pain coming from their sacroiliac joint, and uh, simply physical therapy or acupuncture or, or chiropractic is enough to, to control it. Sometimes just taking anti-inflammatories will, will calm it down and, and make it go away. Um, sometimes uh, the, the pain and the, the, the discomfort is significant enough that uh, repeated injections become necessary. We certainly see that f fairly frequently in our practice. Um, and, uh, and for patients who have had repeated injection uh, and uh, are, are continue to relapse, continue to be symptomatic, and who have the most severe case of, of sacroiliac sacroiliac disease, the uh, option for surgery uh, is now sometimes considered. You know, it's interesting because I think that there, uh, I've read lots of studies with people injecting all sorts of things into that joint. They've tried cortisone, they've tried the new hyaluronic acid, some folks have injected phenol. There's all sorts of things that have tried, have been tried in terms of injecting into that joint. Uh, bottom line is, is not many of them work. I mean, the cortisone works uh, for a short period of time, but uh, everything else has had pretty pretty poor track record in terms of actually giving people permanent relief from that. 
Yeah, as uh, we discussed off camera earlier, this is one of those diagnoses that kind of gives a, uh, a surgeon um, or, a, or a spine specialist the chills because it can be so hard to treat. It, none of the treatments that we've had over time have been uniformly effective. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there have been a number of different approaches to, to surgery on the joint which have been tried over the years and some of them more or less abandoned or reserved for only the most extreme cases because they aren't uniformly effective. Now you as a surgeon who deals with this on an ongoing basis because obviously you do a, a lot of spine fusions and a lot of those patients will end up or, or a significant portion portion of those patients will end up with some degree of, of sacroiliac joint dysfunction and pain. When do you advise patients to consider a surgical option um, for this type of a, of a condition? Well, this is a moving target right now, and um, I would say the short answer to that is very rarely, um, only in the most uh, intractable cases. Uh, I've recently had patients in my practice who had had multiple successful spine surgeries for very significant degenerative problems in their spine, degenerative scoliosis and, and, and spondylosis and stenosis, all of those OCs in the spine, and the spine surgery has worked well on them, and then they wind up with sacroiliitis. Fortunately, it doesn't happen that often, but it does happen. Uh, those patients who then go into injections, and the injections work, but then fortunately the relief is brief, and they have repeated injections, and it doesn't go away. Some of those patients may be candidates uh, for surgery. And we're at the moment in the process of evaluating a modifi modified uh, approach to the surgery for this, which is a fusion uh, that, that may be more effective because of some technological advancements. Well, d describe that for me. I mean, in, in the old days, we, we made big incisions, we opened up that joint, took all the cartilage off that joint, put big screws across the pelvis. It was a, it was a huge operation. And most surgeons would, would really steer patients away from that type of an intervention. As I understand it, like everything else in surgery, we're moving to more and more minimally invasive techniques. What are we doing these days with the sacroiliac joint? What, what's available to us? Well, I agree with what you said. In my training, when I was trained, the, the uh, concept of sacroiliac fusion, it was thought of as sometimes a treatment worth worse than the disease. And, um, and so we steered clear of it. The, uh, the modern uh, armamentarium for uh, spine surgery, and by extension sacroiliac joint surgery, uh, offers us an opportunity to, to look at procedures which are less invasive, less destructive, um, easier to get over, a lower complication rate. Uh, one of the things uh, that has been a big advance in the last five, ten years is the uh, occurrence of something called bone morphogenetic protein. Um, they, uh, there are companies that have developed uh, uh, synthetic, uh, biologically uh, recombinant um, proteins which are involved in the stimulation of bone fusion. And or, or bone formation, and and by extension, that means that we can we can stimulate uh, a fusion to occur. And uh, whereas in the old days, um, it was maybe 50-50 on whether a surgeon's uh, operation actually led to fusion as he had intended. Today, maybe we can approach in, in, in other areas of the body 90, 95, 99 percent fusion rates. Um, and so bone morphogenetic protein is something which may make the sacroiliac fusion, which was a, in the old days a hit or miss operation, something that's more effective, uh, e easier to do, um, and, um, and maybe uh, a solution to this problem. So, so if, if we go back to the notion of creating a fusion, in the old days, as you said, um, Basically, the only thing we had to do was was to to remove the cartilage or remove the surface of the bone that we're trying to fuse, so that we've got raw bony surfaces that are lying together. And then we either put bone graft, which is usually bone that's taken out of the body somewhere else and placed in there. In some ways, that was used as a sort of a fertilizer to try to stimulate the bone growth and then hold everything together as tight as we can while it healed. If I understand you correctly, the the bone, the BMP, the bone morphogenic protein is actually something that is a, almost a drug, uh, something that can be squirted into a, an area and it, 
acts like a stimulant, a, fire, a, a, a fertilizer that tends to make those two bones more likely to grow together. Is, is that correct? Exactly right. And it's finding increasing use of this bone morphogenetic protein, what we call BMP, is finding increasing use in orthopedic surgery and in spine surgery, both areas where sometimes we, what we need to do with a, with a bad joint is fuse it. And, and just to be clear, like you say, uh, if this is a joint and it's broken, and we can't restore the normal function of the joint, what we try to do is get the body to treat that, that joint like a fracture and get, and get the two bones to fuse together. Well, describe for me a little bit about the procedure, the way we use this, this new technique in the sacroiliac joint. Uh, again, in the old days, we made big incisions so we could see that joint, and that joint's pretty deep down in the body. How are you, how are you getting into that joint and how are you getting that bone morphogenic protein into that joint so that it will fuse? Well, one of the modifications of the old operations that I'm evaluating is, uh, is done through a very small incision over the joint on the back, uh, essentially on either side of the tailbone. And uh, make a small incision, go down, cut the ligaments over the top of the joint, um, expose the joint, and then uh, drill a hole essentially into, uh, into the joint which causes uh, either side of the joint to be roughened up to expose the, uh, the interior of, the, of each of the bones and then screw in a titanium cage that has many holes in it. Uh, it's essentially a cylinder that has uh, perforations all the way around. Uh, that cylinder we fill with a sponge that has this bone morphogenetic protein on it. And uh, while we're early in evaluation, uh, in evaluating this technique, the hope is that that will be sufficient to stabilize the joint, but maybe some distraction with this with this cylinder mm -hmm. uh, or, or tensioning of the ligaments, and uh, and then stimulating the bones to heal together. Uh, the, the good news on this technique so far is, is that it's, it's very well tolerated by patients. It is not a painful uh, operation to recover from. And uh, so far, and it, we're very early in looking at this, at this approach to this operation, um, it, it looks good. So like a lot of minimally invasive uh, uh, procedures, we've, we've reduced the size of the incision and hopefully reduced the amount of destruction of normal tissue we have to make to actually get the job done. Exactly. Now is this an outpatient procedure or is this something that the patient should expect to stay in the hospital overnight, two days, three days, how long? Well, I think ultimately, if this uh, turns out the way it, we're, we're hoping, it will be an outpatient procedure. Sometimes that is, um, is guided not by the physician or the surgeon, but by the insurance policy. Medicare, uh, for example, went with any implanted uh, device tends to want patients in the hospital overnight, even if the physician thinks that's unnecessary. Whether that's wasteful of the taxpayer's dollar or not is another discussion, but um, um, ideally this, I think, will be an outpatient procedure. If we, could, if we can develop an outpatient pr procedure which effectively treats sacroiliitis, I think that would be a big step forward. No, I think there's a huge population of patients that could benefit from something like that. Well, let's talk a little bit about the recovery. So if, if this gets to the point where, I mean, today what, what I heard you say is that probably it's one night in the hospital depending, and if you're, if you're elderly and ill, it might be a couple of days in the hospital. But if this gets to be an a, a outpatient procedure, how long does it take for this to heal? What does the patient expect after the surgery is done? How much pain, are they restricted, and how long does it take before it's healed? Well, uh I, I'm not sure I know at this point, uh, Randall. I, I'm early in, in evaluating uh, this particular approach to this uh, problem and, and, and this surgery. Um, but fairly minimal outcome is what is, uh, or recovery is what it appears. Uh, there will, of course, be incisional pain, some soreness um, around the joint. That's normal. That kind of incisional pain and muscular pain usually resolves within a week or two of surgery and is usually pretty well tolerated by by patients. Uh, healing in, in this uh, situation implies also that the bone is fusing together and uh, I, with all fusions some, some uh, of the procedures successfully go on to fusion and some don't. In, uh, in most uh, fusion operations what we expect is a, a time course of six weeks or three months before there's been substantial bony healing. Uh, 
and that essentially that the intention of the operation is, is complete. Um, but we know that that, that process of fusion actually goes on for much longer than that. I think most patients though who undergo any kind of fusion operation, they don't really have symptoms associated with the fusion after the first month. Okay. Um, how about the risk to the patient? Do, do you find that there's any significant risk in this operation that are not, um, are not present in the general operation? Well, all surgery carries with it risk, as you know, all medical procedures, a risk of infection, a risk of bleeding. There's some things that risk of the anesthetic. There's some things we just can't get away from when it comes to, uh, to operating on human beings. Um, in this instance, the sacroiliac joint is in a relatively safe place in the body. There are not a lot of structures which are jeopardized by approaching this joint uh, posteriorly or from the back side. You really don't have to cut through muscle to get in there. You, um, you really don't have nerves, um, spinal nerves, um, anywhere. Uh, nearby that they're jeopardized. So in general, I think that this, um, that ad addressing this uh, uh, sacroiliitis surgically is, is intrinsically safe uh, in, by this method, um, safer than uh, certainly any opening the pelvis or, or, um, or doing more uh, aggressive old, old style approaches to this um, problem. Now, in terms of restrictions for patients after surgery, do, you, do these patients have a cast? Do they have any sort of brace on or are you letting them pretty much go on their own and activity is tolerated? What's the norm? Yeah, there's really no effective way to brace the sacroiliac joint, um, whereas in the lumbar spine we can put a corset around the patient's middle section. You really can't do that with the sacroiliac joint. It's, it's, it's part of their pelvis and, and their hip region, and those things need to move unless you're going to put somebody on a stretcher for three months. So there is no immobilization. Um, Obviously, we wouldn't want a patient water skiing uh, a week after an operation like this, um, but uh, activities of daily living at this point we think are acceptable immediately after the surgery. Um, I operated on a patient uh, with this disorder uh, yesterday, and she's up in the hall walking um, yesterday afternoon. And probably going home today. And going home today. Um, what do you think the future for this technique is? Do, do, are you... Are you uh, Satisfied at this point that, that, that your early results are good enough to continue to explore this, this avenue and continue to recommend this operation to patients? At the present time, we're using these techniques only for the worst of the worst. Um, do, anybody with sacroiliitis doesn't need this operation. We are, we are talking about patients who have had upwards of, uh, of five, six, seven, twelve injections and one or both of their sacroiliac joints. The injections are effective, the diagnosis is not in doubt, um, but the pain is intractable and uh, we think we've reached the end of, of utility with, uh, with injection treatments. So for the worst of the worst, the really intractable cases, we are uh, at this point recommending uh, this. We do not have any long-term um, um, success uh, measures at this point. I think the future, because of the technological advances that we've talked about, uh, may be bright. And, and uh, this has been a, has been a, a very difficult problem in, uh, in, in spine surgery and in, in orthopedic surgery o over the years. And uh, we're going to continue to chip away at it. And with any luck, what we're doing today is going to turn out to be the thing. Can you give any closing remarks to patients who may be suffering from SI joint dysfunction and pain, any sort of pearls of wisdom that you would provide them, either about non-operative treatment, things they should try before they consider this operation, and maybe a little bit of advice about when they should consider um, looking for someone who would potentially do this type of procedure for sacroiliac pain. Well, uh, as I said, I think that at this point, uh, sacroiliitis is, is for the most part is a non-operative problem. And I think patients uh, who are really struggling with this and really have this diagnosis uh, should be uh, being treated regularly by somebody who uh, has some expertise in treating sacroiliitis. Uh, I think that's the most important thing. Um, the sort of catch-as-catch-can approach for, for really a significantly uh, disabled 
disabling problem is, is probably not good enough. So um, see a specialist, see, see a patient, uh, see a physician who, who uh, thinks critically about sacroiliitis and, uh, and follow their advice. And that may just be physical therapy and anti-inflammatories. Uh, it may be uh, acupuncture or chiropractic. It may be uh, injections. And it may ultimately be uh, 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 surgery. And it sounds like to me that despite the bleak sort of prognosis for surgical uh, correction of this problem in the past, uh, patients should understand that there may be a much better option on the horizon. Well, we're hoping. We're, we're looking at it, and we're, we keep trying to help these patients, and, that, and um, um, we'll find out. Thanks very much. Good Th information. Thank you.